Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Janet Archer. I'm the Director of Festivals, Cultural and City Events at the University of Edinburgh and I'm going to be your host for this evening. So a few thanks before we begin. Thank you to everyone at the university who's helped make this series happen, especially the Festivals, Cultural and City Events team. And a special thank you to all of the artists, creatives, academics and cultural leaders who are contributing as panelists across the series. I'm humbled by the incredible mix of people who've agreed to take part. And I'm really looking forward to talking to everyone as the series progresses. Thank you too to the Edinburgh Futures Institute who are our partners for this event. EFI is all about bringing people together to solve global challenges and build a sustainable future, vitally important before COVID, but even more essential now. The series is taking place against the backdrop of the world's biggest festival city, successful because of its extraordinary community of festivals, large and small. 2020 is the first year since 1947 that the spring and summer festivals haven't been able to take place. It feels very important to mark this moment and capture how the arts and creative sectors can help society recover from the effects of COVID-19. We talk a lot about the costs of the arts, but we don't always talk about their value. Through Edinburgh Culture Conversations, we're going to talk about cultural value, social value and economic value from the perspective of many different types of people engaged in academic study and arts practice. Today's event is taking place in the week that's normally the runway into Edinburgh's incredible festivals. And the impact of festivals not being able to go ahead has been profound and many have been impacted. Some of the financial support measures include a focus on research and development. And this has created much valued space to help artists and arts organizations reflect on how to adjust their practice in the wake of the pandemic and experiment with ways of of trying to deal with constraints as best as possible forced on us by corona, coronavirus. So tonight we're going to be looking at how are artists responding to the pandemic? Which work from this period will we remember and how will it influence future practice? And I think this is a really important conversation because it focuses on individual practitioners, what they contribute to society and also what they need in place in order to be able to deliver their work well. Freelancers make up 70% of the performing arts workforce and as such are central to the fabric of the arts landscape. If you add the visual arts and other art forms like filmmaking to that, it's a significant number of people across, across the fabric of the arts. So a couple of housekeeping points before we begin. I'd like to ask you to save your questions until about halfway through. I'll do as, as best as I can to take as many as possible, but I'm sure I won't get them all in. So please forgive me if I don't, we don't manage to answer all of your questions. And to ask a question, you can use the Zoom Q&A function and you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. And be aware that we're recording the event. Take that into account in answering questions and also be aware that the university's approach to ethics means that we're guided by the principles of dignity, respect for others, integrity, objectivity and openness. So I'll ask you to present questions in this context and we will reserve the right to remove questions if they don't fit within this. So before I introduce my guests for this evening, I want to also introduce uh, Donna Jewell and Greg Kaloon from Just Sign, who are our BSL interpreters for this evening. So now I'm going to introduce my guests for this evening. I'm going to ask each to say a few words about themselves. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Guy Kools, um, who's a dance dramaturg. Guy, welcome. Um, can you say a few words about yourself? Um, yeah, I've been working in the field of contemporary dance for about 30 years. I originally started as a critic and then I was for 12 years a curator and uh, creating the, a program in the Art Centre for Art in Ghent, Belgium, all through the 90s. In the last 20 years I've been freelancing, so I'm mainly working uh, in creative processes with choreographers um, in very different countries, so very international, uh, Europe and also North America. Um, um, I think that's sufficient as an introduction. And I'm, I'm uh, at the moment I'm at home in Vienna where I live. Like, thank you, Guy. Um, I'm going to move us on to Professor Juan Cruz, who's the principal of Edinburgh College of Art at the University of Edinburgh. Hello, 
Hello, Gwen. Have you got your microphone on? <laughs> Sorry about that. Very good. Boy error. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Juan Cruz, and thank you, Janet, and, and hello, everybody. I'm principal of Edinburgh College of Art at the University of Edinburgh, where we have subject areas in music, art, design, architecture, and history of art. And we spent the last four or five months trying to kind of take all those disciplines online, both for teaching and assessment, and indeed planning about how we did it in, in, in September in a hybrid model, uh, which of course has been very challenging for these creative creative disciplines. And I feel we've learned a lot through that through that process. Um, I'm an artist by, by background. I, I trained as a painter and now work mainly in, in video and, and, and with writing. And, and I have, in fact, exhibited some work during, during the lockdown period through, a, through an online exhibition. So I had some experience of that um, as well. Um, I'm interested in, 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 in the themes proposed by Janet for this discussion for all those reasons and also some other research I've done in the past looking at um, the, the kind of um, the inhibitors, I suppose, particularly for visual art in relation to digital dissemination and indeed uh, marketing of, of, of artworks. Uh, so looking forward to the discussion uh, this evening. Thank you. So moving on to Susie, Susie Glass, who's an independent producer and cultural consultant. Hello, um, so I'm Susie. Uh, I'm based in Scotland. I live in Calendar, so I can see mountains out of the window. Um, I also have a two and a six year old at home, which I think it's important I say because it's nearing bedtime and it's the witching hour and they may well appear. So say hi if they do. Um, I work uh, across art forms and often across different industries as well. Uh, I make normally complex work with uh, differing groupings of people building stakeholder groupings and I suppose massaging the space in between people. Uh, earlier this year, I did a piece of work uh, with someone who I think is in the audience, um, with the International Futures Forum for Scottish Government's um, incredible Firestarter Festival, looking at how the producing methodologies I use, which are very relational based on how we work together as people, how those methodologies might be useful as a way of enabling transformational change and innovation in the public sector more widely, which may become relevant in this conversation. Um, what else? I, I'm known as someone who specialises in digital and site specific work, but actually that's not intentional. It's just that I make, I enjoy making ideas that can get to people and outdoor spaces and digital platforms are both really excellent ways of getting to a huge range of people. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. And we'll move on to Stuart, who's a filmmaker and director of Create Anything. Yes, uh, yeah, I am a film director. I my, my background is also art. Um, I have art and human mind. I have a love for the human mind. So naturally, that's how, how I started um, directing. My last documentary was Black and Scottish um, on the BBC. It's now on BBC iPlayer. Um, following that, I then started my own uh, production company, Create Anything, and it's the first black-led um, commissioned a company in Scotland um, and following that I now advise for the Scottish Government, um, the Education Board, um, just basically trying to make sure that, that black stories are told, BAME stories are told in, in general. Um, it's, been, it's been the amount of work I've managed to get after um, making um, the documentary is really good throughout throughout the UK. I've been asked to to make um, black and Irish and black and Welsh uh, documentaries, and uh, the, most of my stories are from a BAME perspective. So um, that's part of my remit. So that's the kind of discussion I'm I'm looking to have. Brilliant, thank you, Stuart. And I'm going to move on to Karine Polwart, and I'm really enjoying the links between all of you. Um, Karine, you studied philosophy uh, and philosophical inquiry. Um, so lots of connection there with Stuart's love for the human mind. Indeed, yeah. And actually a lot of my work is about asking questions, asking good questions that I don't have the answer for. Um, but I come from a background as a folk singer, songwriter. Um, uh, in the past few years, I've moved into writing and performing in theatre. Um, and also working with um, visual artists and illustrators um, in a, as an author uh, uh, as well. Um, and I, I, a lot of my work is collaborative, most of it is collaborative. A lot of it depends upon live performance, so my, my, my income, to be frank, depends upon live performance, but most of my work is actually 
um, uh, based here at home in Midlothian. Um, I, I live amongst a community of musicians and artists that live in the village uh, here um, south of Edinburgh and I produce most of my own work. That's it. Thank you. And then moving on to Hannah, last but not least. Hi. Hannah, Hi, so I'm Hannah. Um, I am an artist, composer and performer and I work with The Voice and increasingly with Gesture to tell stories beyond or before words. Um, and I work across um, live performance and uh, moving image and multi-channel um, audiovisual installation and I do lots of site-specific work um, and I'm particularly interested in our relationship with the more than human. Thank you. So everybody, all of you, have had to adjust hugely to the shock of going into lockdown uh, and the impact of coronavirus and the pandemic in terms of how you have uh, how your practice works and, and 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 how you've lived your lives Corinne, particularly you um you were about to show wind resistance your um piece produced in 2016 i think uh, at the royal lyceum theater uh, just as you went into lockdown um, and Hannah, I know you had work which you've had to put on hold. Um, how I don't know who wants to go quest first with this question, but how how have you responded to the pandemic? Um, and what are your observations in relation to other artists are responding to the pandemic at this particular point in time? Um, I'm going to go to Guy actually. Um, you work with many artists as a dance dramaturg many of whom are touring artists uh, and who, who rely on touring to be able to deliver their work. How, what are your observations in terms of how people are dealing with this very difficult time um, in, in the history of the arts? I, mean, I think it was about four or five uh, productions that were had to be interrupted uh, that I was involved with in different countries, in Canada, in Holland, in Athens, a production, one in Germany. Um, but very quickly, I think everybody involved, because I'm, I'm working in dance, so we, we need to be close together in one space to work. Um, the production in Athens was, is a good example. All the performers were Greek. Uh, the choreographers are based in Brussels. I myself live in Vienna, and there were other people from the artistic team who were in France and in other places. Uh, we, we were rehearsing for one week and then we had to stop rehearsing um, and then we tried to keep the rehearsal process going online and very quickly everybody realized and this was the same thing for all the other processes that okay the market is has stopped but creativity hasn't stopped um, and there was even a sense in most of the processes I've been involved in that what happened is that we had to slow down the creative process but because of the slowing down there was a little bit more depth in the preparation and the research and this depth and preparation was also more collaborative uh, what i mean is that normally a lot of the preparation would only be done by me and the choreographers in, 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 before we go into the studio and then once we're in the studio it has to go fast and it has to be productive but now the, each time the whole team was involved, also all the dancers, and we went, we went online for several weeks and for sure it doesn't replace the studio work, but somehow the preparation time that we were giving ourselves and yeah, it was more depth and, and every, everybody's voices were more involved than in a usual uh, process. So this, this we, we all felt was something that we gained. Uh, and then eventually we were still waiting to go back into the studio to go back to the actual work. But there's been something about a pause, about slowing down, uh, that is also a richness as far as the creative process is concerned. I know. And Hannah, how does that feel for you? Um, have you had the same kind of experience or was there a different sort of response in the first instance? Mm, maybe my response was a little more anxious. Um, so I was in the middle of production for a new piece for Helsinki Biennial 
um, which involved performance to camera that will then um, be presented. Well, it was supposed to open in June. Um, and the venues all closed. I tried to set up a, a film set in the um, upstairs of a pub in Glasgow. <laughs> um, meanwhile, watching the death toll rising, beginning to feel more and more anxious, all my other work getting cancelled. And then I just made the decision that I couldn't keep trying to make the work and to just stop. But actually, I just needed to stop because I couldn't make work in the face of what was going on. It felt, what was the point in making art when so many people are dying? That felt very present. And um, then slowly things began to shift. But I'm also aware how we're normalizing the situation right now as we try to return to what we had before. Um, yeah, and that's a big question is and, and, and language like new normal uh, or new real is starting, starting to appear uh, and of course none of us really know what that means. Stuart, with filmmaking um, there's the semblance of normality in that productions are starting to be able to be made again. How do you feel that your industry responded to the pandemic uh, and everything that has happened societally during it? Well, in my industry, from from um, working with the networks, everything everything shut down. Um, it was chaos when 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 this happened uh, for us. We found that the networks had to start repeating, um, start bringing in all our archive shows and repeating, etc. And obviously, from a film perspective, you 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 have to be in front of people. You have to have the camera. You have to get in their face and 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 find the the emotions. Obviously, we, we could we, we could no longer do that. However, um, the network still had to report. So you had things like social distancing um, interviews. You had your interview, the news reporter, and holding the boom mic, etc. Um, things like that, kind of ways for them to adapt. But for production companies, majority of the production stopped. I I um, just secured a commit a uh, one hour commission. Um, for the BBC just prior to, to lockdown. It was all, all all ready to go. However, part of that was to to travel um to the States, down south, London, etc. But that we couldn't we couldn't do that. But fortunately, um we took took that down to half an hour um and made it a more intimate um a documentary. As I've mentioned before, the, the, the guidelines are very, very challenging. Um the COVID nineteen guidelines just could you can just imagine um uh, what that is like so that's a guide that we all had to follow um but i've been fortunate enough to be able to shoot this documentary um uh, during lockdown because um as a production company i own my own equipment so i didn't have to go out and hire I had all the cameras lighting etc cetera, etc cetera. so that kind of helped helped me but i would say um for me it was actually advantageous um the lockdown because um, I at the time I just purchased some new cinema cameras and I was just testing testing them and my, my daughter who was in um, the Black and Scottish documentary who it was it was shaped around her she's also in um, in theatre school um, she's a dancer she's a singer she's a kind of all rounder so what I did was just a, just kind of documented her. Um, daily life during lockdown so you're homeschooling playing and you know interacting and, and learning and just what it, what is it like for a, a nine-year-old girl during this time so anyway I um, created I created a little television show trailer for her um, called at Yasmin's house and it was just basically this girl looking to discover create and play and find find ways to speak to to let's say she wanted to learn about um, space and astronauts, instead of her go instead of her going out there to interview, she would do it via via Zoom, for example. But anyway, what happened was um, testing the new cameras and working with my daughter 
um, with the rest of the family, I then um, came up with an idea for a television show and then pitched that to a well-known um, network. And it looks like it's, it's, going, it's going to happen. So that's something that I wouldn't have been able to do um, out with um, the lockdown. Um, and I actually secured another um, uh, documentary as well. So I think, I think for me, it gave me the time to, to gave me the time to spend time with family, think of new creative I ideas, um, and also just kind of sit back and reflect on what it is that I want to do. And coming off the back of of Black Lives Matter, etc., um, again, it made me kind of sit back and go right. Okay, I think I know what it is that I'm I'm I want to do. I think I know I want to kind of represent the BAME and um, community. So for me, having that ca camera equipment there, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be having this, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but I'm for, I feel like I've been fortunate enough to, to be able to take advantage of what's happening now. But how, however, the industry is still trying to, productions are starting to, to come about now, but the industry is, is, is all over the place. And I think, um, some of the things that some of the takeaways are that do we need such a big team behind behind the set? Um, the, the, there's some things that we've learned going forward that we may kind of introduce um, in further productions, but in general, um, no, no, a lot of content was paused. So it's for me, it's been advantageous, but for the, a lot of other production companies that I know of, it's been fairly difficult for them. And that's an interesting point, Stuart. Thank you for that. In, 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 in that small is beautiful, to coin a phrase, um, which um, Rowan Dodds um, produced for all of us, I think, a, a, a com beautiful conference and symposium event looking at exactly that point. Does everything have to be big? And Kareen, certainly the conversation that we had prior to this event um, centered on that idea of what can be done at a, a, a local level. Um, yes. To bring some of your thoughts into play there. Yeah, well, I think for me, the past few months has been a bit of an evolving picture. I certainly, sh I, I think the early, early stages of it very much like Hannah, I was in a state of such panic about the loss of my live work. I lost 20% of my annual turnover in a week. Um, so it was pretty devastating income um, loss and had no idea how I would sustain myself because the bulk of my income does come from um, live music and theatre performance. And, um, and also I have a 10 year old daughter. I'm so, I'm so endeared by Stuart's story about like talking about your daughter and making something, collaborating with her on making something. What a beautiful response. I, I, I confess I wasn't able to muster that degree of creativity with my children and um, we did do a lot of gardening and I dug a lot I, I dug I literally dug for six weeks and planted tatties and kale and that was really my creative endeavor was to um, engage with my my garden and with local food projects in my village that were set up in response to the pandemic because there was a big issue here about in access to um, fresh food and our bus service went down so all the older people and the people in the village with um, less resources where literally, you know, there was no way to get even your basic shopping in our village for many people. And that really made me think very, very hard about where I live. And I only live half an hour south of Edinburgh, so I'm not in the sticks. Um, but the loss of our bus service had a profound effect on what happened around me and made me concentrate on my neighbours and in particular on elderly neighbours and the impact it was having on them. And the, the earliest pieces of work that I did in lockdown, I did them out of a feeling that I had to. Like if, if I stopped, I wouldn't be an artist anymore. I, like it would just invalidate my entire identity <laughs> if I wasn't making something. Um, and and they, were, they were both about where I live, literally kind of documenting what was happening around me. Um, but I began to realise that actually the amount of effort that that required, um, whilst looking half time after children on my own and the only adult in my house, it became spiritually and emotionally just really difficult to make anything. Um, but where it's, where, where, and, and then the, the nadir of that was uh, um, at one point being sent camera equipment through the post by the BBC um, for a, a live music show. And I had to rip apart my entire house to create a room at, at, in which it wasn't just filled with crap. Um, my 12 year old was the camera assistant 
um, I had to film myself from five different angles. It took days and days and days. And by the end of it, I'd lost all the contents of my freezer because I'd had to turn my freezer off because it was too noisy. And the whole thing was like some crazy farce of like, oh my, my goodness, I'm like a performer, but I've become a filmmaker, I've become a sound engineer, I've become a set designer. I, I've had to assume all these roles and that's been very common amongst people in my sector is musicians feeling that they have to become experts in many, many art forms that are actually art forms for people like Stuart. <laughs> They're art forms for other people. Um, and, and, and a degree of panic around that. And my saving grace, if I can say something positive about it, has come since lockdown has began to open up a bit. And the things that I've done that have been of most joy and value to the people around me, and, and they're being done by my neighbours, many of whom are also musicians, are back garden gigs for people who are shielding. And that's been the things that have um, made me feel like I have a point, to be frank, is um, curating gigs for older men who, who haven't been able to leave their houses um, because they're ill. And um, that's making me think now about what I want to do in the future. And my eye is very much not on national or international travel. It's, it's around how can I be of more service to the people that I actually live amongst. And that's absolutely incredible, Kareem. And, and goodness me, I wish I was your neighbour. <laughs> and <laughs> Susie, you've been supporting many artists in this period, uh, particularly in relation to exploring what sort of skills people need to build to be able to work on digital platforms. So some of the things that Kareem was talking about there. Uh, how do you think um, the people that you're talking to are reacting uh, to the pandemic? Uh, and what are the challenges that you're starting to, to see through and, and, and how do you think people are dealing with those? Okay, so this is a piece of work I'm delivering for Creative Scotland that allows me to spend up to three hours with 22 artists and organisations to talk about what transitioning to presenting or being in digital environments might feel like to them. And actually, I would say... 90% of those conversations end up being conversations about an emotional landscape and what kind of connection you want to make with people. And so, Karina, I was nodding because all of the stuff you're saying is so deeply relevant to everyone I've been talking about. What the meaning is that you need to communicate, who you're needing to communicate that to, and what the best way of doing that is given the restrictions that are in place around you. And obviously, I'm focusing on digital tools, but for some people, that means setting up a radio network a local radio network to be able to stand in a courtyard in a i don't know a assisted housing complex and talk to people through their windows while they stick sugar paper on the wall you know that it doesn't necessarily mean making a augmented reality interface where someone in chile can dance in their bedroom with someone in i don't know edinburgh um it, it, although it can be, and those conversations are happening, but actually all the skills and the technical aptitude and ability, that all comes from collaborating and from conversation. The most important bit is that people understand why they need to make, what meaning they need to communicate and who they need to communicate that to, that to and whether those people need them to do it. And that for me has been the really amazing thing about some of the conversations I've been able to have during this however many thousands of days we've been stuck at home with our children. Um, the, and to echo what Guy was saying, it's actually the, the ability to pause and to look deeply, Karine, you were saying similar, in fact, all of you have said it, to look deeply at what you do and why you do it and how you can do it in the most meaningful way possible. That's a, there will come a point when we're not being hit over the head by death and you know, all the trauma that's around us, and I feel incredibly deeply. When we're not there, there will come a point when that, the value of that will become clear. The value of the moment to address what meaning is and why, we, why we're making and how we communicate effectively with people who need us will become so precious, I think. Thank you. And one, you had the unenviable task of, of leading a, a cohort of students into graduation, some of whom had been studying for five years at ECA. How did that work? Um, in, in, and, and what do you think those students will have learned through this period? And what will they take into tomorrow? I think you need to just do your microphone again. There, you there we go. go. 
Um, you think you think after five months of this, I'd have learned to run. Um, um, I, I think it's been really tough for students, and, and, I, and I don't want to make light of it by by overemphasizing the positives, actually, because I do think you know on some level it's really you know bad luck to be a student graduating just when this is happening. But but I, but I think there have been there have been some positives. I mean, if if I can characterize the reaction of the students, and I, and I don't want to kind of um, generalize, but of course. There was a there was a huge amount of kind of shock and anger and um, you know panic and, and disappointment and, and denial really about about everything that was happening and you know so institutionally we had to uh, you know work with the students to make you know to, to try to get to a position that, that we had there were certain things we had to do that weren't really decisions that we we were making we simply couldn't have a physical show we simply couldn't have our buildings open and so that that took quite a bit of um, of um, a discussion and, and negotiation, and we very quickly had to shift our um, our way of teaching into something that was available online uh, for people, and that meant changing a lot of academic regulations, but also having quite a lot of conversations with students about what what it was that they might expect from us. Uh, and not, I mean, I think something that we lent on. I think maybe this echoes some of the things that other people said was that was that you know, well, well, yes, we didn't have access to facilities or studios or spaces. Uh, we did have access to people. So, you know, in a sense, the quality of the people that, that, that students were speaking to um, was really important. And, and, you know, we had to shift quite quickly to so, sort of model of, of online delivery. Now, there are, you know, there are such things as online degrees and online courses. And I think for, from our perspective, we, we looked at that. But there was no way in which we could pretend that we were, you know, uh, delivering a kind of fully functioning online educational experience in that time. It was really just trying to do what we did live, but you know, through these kind of through these kind of platforms. Um, I think when it came when it came, and, and there was all sorts of complications about exams and shows and regulations that, that I won't go into. When it came to the to the shows, um, I think what we what we um, what it did give us the opportunity to do uh, in trying to kind of think about how the students' work could be presented uh, virtually on an online platform um, was to try to examine a little bit, not, 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 not exactly to find kind of exact equivalents for what an exhibition might be, but the way we tried to approach it that was interesting was to try and question why it was that we did shows anyway. So, so what did people expect from uh, this final exhibition in terms of uh, you know, and broke it down into such things as as, as the kind of the ritual of the, the celebration, the um, the networking, the uh, the engagement with professional communities, the the engagement with the kind of social communities. You know, the, us showing each other what we were doing, and and I, and I think it did enable us, and it did force us really uh, to develop a much kind of more uh, accurate and detailed sense of the of the function of these exhibitions and who really they were for and what they should do. And I think in some respects. Um, some of the things that we've done with the show ultimately have probably been more effective uh, in terms of engaging alumni and engaging kind of industry, engaging employers than, than they probably have been before uh, in, you know, th with these things getting a little bit lost in the kind of big party of the, of the show itself and the ritual and the celebration and the kind of carnival of, of all of that, which I must say I also think is really important. I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of our students and our staffs and myself have been missing missing the party I mean you know that, that's one thing that's really that that kind of social dynamic and social interaction of the life is really difficult to replicate online I know at the beginning of lockdown there were various kind of zoom drink parties which have tended to peter out I think partly because yeah, people have ended up feeling a bit daft trying to celebrate something in, in in that way so I think that that's shifted um I mean I must say something that I'm that I'm left with as someone who's been involved in you know like everybody in these areas for quite a long time is is a sense of how um, I, I, I wondered why we weren't in a way better prepared. I mean, I, I don't mean in terms of, you know, educationally, because I think Edinburgh and the university has got amazing resources in terms of online learning and flexible learning and, and all of that. So I think all, all that is, is, kind of, is, is kind of there. But I mean, in, ter in terms of my own discipline, in terms of, you know, fine art or visual arts, um, I did, you know, we, we've, been, we've been living in a sort of digital world for many, many years now. Um, and I did find myself thinking, why aren't we better at just kind of, you know, flipping? Why haven't we made more use or encouraged more dissemination of artworks via digital routes? Why haven't we kind of worked a bit harder to facilitate engagement and uh, activities through, through digital means? Um, and that, I, d I did feel a little bit like, um, uh, like I couldn't quite figure out the lack of preparedness, uh, you know, for that. Not that we would have anticipated a pandemic, but j just in terms of it certainly made me think and made colleagues think a lot more about how moving forward um, a part of any sort of curriculum and any kind of training or, or engagement with, 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 with kind of um, you know, st art, students, artists, 
it w would have to be about about these about you know the opportunities that these that these platforms allow. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's a very good question. I think I've got two two of our panelists wanting to come in. So Hannah and then Guy. Hi. No, it was really. Um, I just wanted to add because. Um, when you asked the question, um, I was sort of plunged back into those first few days of anxiety and um, things don't feel so despairing now, but I wanted to maybe just say something a little bit about there's the practical impact of the loss of work or the loss of income and the loss of platform. Um, I hate that word platform actually, I'm not going to use that word. Um, and then the emotional impact on well-being and I went through some depressive depressive time um, and then the way that work is not just to earn money but it's to nurture self and how to nurture self through practice and then through nurturing self through practice how that allows you to then serve a community but I think maybe this time there's something that everyone seems to be talking about this being a space for pause to ask why, why we're making the work we're making and who we're serving, who is the work for, um, is it just for a privileged few or is it um, uh, for local community, is it for, um, uh, I've lost my thread. <laughs> but I want to absolute sense Hannah and it is a theme and Karin is nodding and raised that point about meaning which I think is coming through from all of you. Key, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Again there's, there's two things listening to you and again I don't know all of you but you what I share is, is also this ex experience with my my two-year-old son like this Stuart was mentioning, Karin was mentioning, Susie was mentioning it that even for him I felt this pause was beneficial for his development because it would never happen that both his parents were 24 hours at home over such long stretch. Uh, and so for instance, language skills kind of, they, they, they boomed. And so this was hap is happening with the children and it was also happening with, with us, as I heard from the others. I had to develop a lot of new skills in a very short time. I, I, I produced my first podcast, which was something I wouldn't have thought about making a podcast, but now having done it, I feel it's, it's, a, it's a perfect medium that I can add to my other things. So there's something about, uh, and then the other thing that my own, I've been thinking a lot, there's something about, for me, this tension between, uh, as an artist to make a living, you have to be successful in a segment of the market, and there's this other big issue, which is for me the more and more important, but also as Karina was saying, as an artist, you want to work with a certain community and, and relate to community. And I think there's a huge paradigm shift happening there. One of the most inspirational um, thinkers or writers is Adam Kraus, who is a Norwegian art theoretician. And he already published a while ago, this little book is called Art as Politics. And he exactly, literally says, it should in the future maybe it should not be any more about being trying to be as successful as possible in the marketplace but it's more about uh, being part of communities and i think also what i experienced um through, i mean i got six months of work um interrupted so it was also not that was all the time positive but what i experienced i only got difficulties with the big institutions like the, the biennale in venice to get compensated uh, for the work that for a contract that was signed while all the other communities i was part of and the process that was there was immediately support systems being created uh, amongst each other like that so um and then last thing uh my own research for at the moment is very much about uh, processes of mourning and how art has been supported that and I, I just re I was just rereading the last couple of days uh, the new black by um, Darren Lido is a UK uh, psychiatrist, and one of the main theses of that book is that art one of the main he says art has this big function that it also in, to support mourning and, and support processes of, of loss 
uh, just by just creating, showing that there is a life after and that we can create. So already the act of creating is, is an answer to the, the loss that we're experiencing at, at different levels of like that. Thank you, Guy. That's, that's very powerful. I've got two hands up and it's great to know that this is turning into a real conversation on Zoom. Karine, I'm going to take you next and then Susie. Yeah, it's a few things that have just bounced off several contributions um, there. Uh, one is around mental, mental health and well-being and, um, and, and looking beyond my own experience about the impact of this time on um, friends and peers and it's been there's been quite polarized experiences I think some some have relished the um, being um, relinquished from the productive indus industrial cycles of making um, and I, I, and I think some have are beginning to question those industrial cycles as a result a lot of what passes for art is really just capitalist industry and it's not healthy um, and it's not um, it's, it's not about equality and it's not about access and it's not about well-being um, so I think there's a few people that that's caught short who have been in, in the thick of those productive cycles um, equally I, I have friends and peers who who are so um, um, so uh, dependent now upon this this um, online um, ways of teaching and, and engaging with people that they're in a permanent state of stress and unable to make or reflect or think they're looking after families or looking after dependents and they're absolutely exhausted by this digital realm thoroughly thoroughly scunnered and feel completely um, like they've lost their artistic identities as a result and there's something in all of this I think around who the situation benefits and who it doesn't and when we ask questions like what art will outlive this period we're really asking what artists um, have the resources to manage this period and what artists don't and they are very those if you ask those questions there are very particular groups of people who are marginalized and unable to respond to the circumstances both because of their personal circumstances but also because of the kind of art that they make and amongst my friends and peers who make participative community art so amongst the, the stuff that's really about engagement and meaning and purpose and community those uh, practices are absolutely decimated and I think will be amongst the last to come back on stream because they depend like Guy talking about dance upon bodies in space and actual physical emotional engagement so I've got real concerns about who floats in the circumstances and who doesn't and in the realm of skills development I can see brilliant things about loads of my peers becoming really adept at making yeah, podcasts, filming, all kinds of really beautiful collaborative endeavours but I can also see who's able to do that and who's not and there are people disappearing and I am worried about that. Yeah. And Susie, you want to come in? So, um, a similar point to Corrine, I was nodding, you don't nod vociferously, do you? I was nodding the, the equivalent of vociferously when Guy was talking about his two-year-old, but at the same time in my head was, there are many, many two-year-olds who are not thriving in this who are not thriving, who don't have safe spaces and don't have safe parents. And, you know, just, uh, it, it, I guess my brain was <laughs> arguing and I felt I needed to say out loud that for every bit of positive that we find, there's also a whole world that isn't our, my world anyway, that, that is desperate. Um, but then also, and I can't, I'll try and make the threads pull together. I'm not sure I'll be able to though. When, when Juan was talking about why weren't we prepared, I was thinking, I, I did, a, I produced, implemented a huge digital innovation capacity building program years ago now in Scotland. And the reason I did that with the people I was working with was because it's incredibly important that we understand what digital tools are and how embedded and fundamental they are sometimes unknowingly and unconsciously within our daily lives. And if we can't, as artists and arts practitioners and arts programmers and, and curators, reflect what's going on with digital tools under the belly of everything, then we can't, if we can't use them to tell stories and to tell stories about them, then we can't have a conversation about how 21st century life is changing, growing, uh, sometimes malevolently into a, a whole different way of being. And that, that, that why weren't we prepared thing to me seems politically and socially way, way more acute when you begin to go, 
And what if we're not prepared? And what if artists, we're not giving artists the ability, the, the right, the voice, the platforms, the ways of communicating to be able to have conversations that are critical to who we are as human societies. Uh, so that also popped into my mind. And yeah, I haven't made those two come together. <laughs> Thank you. One. Sorry, I haven't figured out to put my hand up digitally. <laughs> it shows me my digital kind of uh, skills. Um, I think I think that those points are really are really interesting, and it, it it raises a question for me. When when I talked about the kind of preparedness of the you know artists to work in a digital realm, and certainly one of the interests that that I have in in terms of artists doing that in visual arts, it it is about you know how how can one find you know forms of dissemination or engagement of art that maybe doesn't necessarily need to go through what is quite a you know narrow market. I mean in 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 kind of you know contemporary art, there are maybe I don't know three hundred. Kind of serious collectors around the world that are that are really keeping keeping this this sort of world afloat on a, on a kind of market scale and and, and it, it, it's a, it's a it's a really odd odd kind of kind of economy and and I think some of the inhibitors that are there in terms of visual arts and the digital are to do with 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 that kind of exclusivity that that, that the arts is, to a certain extent require but I'm also interested in in what Karine says that, that we mustn't kind of assume that the the, the digital or the online or whatever you know we want we want to call them it's probably the online. Um, or digital um, is, is is necessarily a kind of panacea to that. You know, it's not necessar necessarily a kind of demo democratizing kind of um, influence of the arts or something that necessarily you know provides access uh, for people to the arts or, or indeed facilitates um, engagement or livelihoods for artists. I think it's, it it seems it's a much more kind of complex uh, question than that. I don't have the answer, but I'm I'm, I'm struck by the I'm struck by the question or the, or the dilemma. Thank you, Stuart. You wanted to come in, and then Hannah. Yeah, so um, as Karine touched on mental health, and it's, some, it's something that um, I've been looking into recently. The documentary I'm making now is, um, it tackles uh, PTSD, mental, mental health. It's called Behind the Smile. What is it like by social media influencers when they turn off the camera? You know, it's like this, this, this guy, is this bubbly, smiley guy that just, you know, he, he puts a smile in his fans' faces, you know, just from the kind of comedy perspective but the documentary is, is he is a creative and the documentary really is about um mental health and it's something that uh, as i was saying the kind of stories that, that i want to make is something that i i can um relate to and just from what kuhn said about what artists will be what will be left and you know it just made me think of an idea for a documentary in the sense of finding those artists that that kind of didn't aren't resilient like ourselves to be able to to continue to create and the reason reason being for, for me why mental health is very important is because um at the age of 25 um i was diagnosed with bipolar bipolar 2 um and having by and uh, uh, having bipolar 2 right and then obviously having the love of the human mind it made me have to it made me have to be self-aware and kind of from the outside looking in and kind of step back and, and kind of understand who you are as a human being first. And that's something that for me took, took um, many years. And I speak to a lot of people about um, mental health. This is what, something that we touched on. Now, we're all creatives and a lot of people um, on just now um, are creatives as well. And you, you'll all understand the link between um, creativity and uh, mental health. So... I think it's some. I think it's something that um, we should be aware of because one of the main questions is what 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 are we going to look back on? Um, and I think just just from the, the conversation kind of sparked my interest in going. Maybe a major part of that will be um, touching on mental health because it isn't just between in the creative industry. It's also it's basically everyone who kind of lost. If you if you see it as a loss, you know what what did they actually lose? But um, I think that's something that I think I, I think what it is is I'm just thinking out loud because just from what Karina had mentioned, I just felt I feel like that's something that's a narrative, a kind of dialogue that I've not really been been hearing. Hence the reason why I wanted to make um, this documentary, but kind of coat it around comedy and social media. But really, the core of it is is actually a mental health and how these people are co coping um, in general, but also more so. Um, during these times and I think that's something that maybe we all need to address um, now and later on down the line because because you know some some of the great artists out there that have not been discovered will not be discovered now because they they didn't have the coping mechanism to to 
be resilient and continue to be creative. I'm very lucky because I'm the kind of person that, kind of, as I said, um, understands how the brain works. Um, but maybe that's something going forward that we need to educate others on so that we don't lose these creative talents out there. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you for being so open with us. That's very much appreciated. And Hannah, you wanted to come in. Just really um, to respond to Corinne's point about the capitalist industry of the arts. Um, I think at the minute there's something um, that's coming up about freelancers being against institutions. And I'm just interested in whether any of the panelists here have any um, ways of thinking about how the art world could be restructured from a kind of um, top-down um, art world. What 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 are the ways can we can we can we work within? How can we make systems change? And then secondly, the the sense of how we don't just translate what we do into online. How we can make new ways of doing things online. And in that, how do we um, build spaces online that are about conversations and community? Because, you know, when I go to a gig or a performance or something, so much of, of what I learn in this space of knowledge exchange is about conversations with other audience members. Like, how do we create that liveness in the online and that kind of discursive, um, chatty space that's not Facebook. <laughs> so who has an answer to that? That's, I think that's a very pertinent question. I was talking to an actor the other day who said that the special thing about theatre is that everybody has to turn up. The performers have to turn up, the crew has to turn up, the box office staff have to turn up, and the audience has to turn up at the same time. Um, it isn't always like that with in digital spaces. Uh, Susie, I'm looking at you um, as the investigator of all such things. I'd be a millionaire if I had this answer, my God. Um, so I do have some answers though, or at least I have some more questions to add to the pile. Everything that we're using has been designed. It's just not been designed for the purposes we want to use them for. And often it's been designed by people who are working in very commercial environments and are uh, short-circuiting some, some uh, I guess, flabby ways of flat flabby relational ways of working that don't get you to bottom line quickly um so this these videos that here are compressed they're highly compressed we can't have audio that overlaps with each other because it's too the media becomes too rich and it can't be hosted in an environment effectively cost effectively but it, but it is still designed so there's no reason why groupings of people wouldn't design different things to serve different purposes and so there's a, an example I sometimes use when I'm talking about this. Most, well, you probably all know, AI is generally ingesting <laughs> views and opinions held by the people who are writing the algorithms and then by the people that those algorithms are collecting from the world. If you change the viewpoint of the person who writes your initial algorithm, you change everything. You change everything that that AI does. It's the same with a VR headset or, and, and all the associated bits and pieces that go with virtual reality hardware designed for men by men so if you're a woman who gesticulates a lot which women tend to more than men then it's a really not healthy happy environment for you because it's made for chest up and it's probably a bit big the headset's a bit big and so all these things though that they're, they're designed and they come to a marketplace the marketplace discussion is a really complex one and i have no answers but the people who are doing don't i donut economies at the moment might have some answers but I don't but they're all the point I do have an answer for is we can design anything we can make anything just we need to come up with the ideas and do it right yeah absolutely um and just just to pause for a moment uh, there's a question come through that says will Susie's research for Creative Scotland be made public sounds fascinating and essential uh, so that is not straightforward research. It's consultancy for groups of people who have applied in uh, to get access to <laughs> me for their sins, um, to conversation. Uh, so I will be able to pull out, the, I guess, the key findings from the conversations that I'm having and publicise those at some point. 
Thank you. So I am going to now open up questions to come through and indeed they are starting to come through. So we've got a question from David Waring, uh, who's wondering about the idea of slowing down or pausing. And do you think it's possible to really allow for this if it seems that it might be much more pos positively affect many more people more equally and inclusively? Um, he's saying it seems as if all of you in one way or another agree or are sympathetic to the idea or the benefit of creating a different pace and rhythm for the systems that might exist or support um, either arts funding or educational purposes. Any thoughts, please? Um, does anybody want to respond to that point? I can. Janet, I can. One, thank you. But it, it's partly in response to, I mean, and maybe just um, ex extending a little bit on, on, on the discussion before and Hannah's question about, about um, you know, how you do things online. Because at, at, at the moment we seem to be in a, we, we seem to be part of the kind of drive that, that m many of us have at the moment is that we're trying to do the stuff that we'd normally do offline online. And so these environments become a kind of surrogate or a replacement for the things that we, that we can't do. Um, and I'm not sure that that's that's in, you know that I'm not sure that's entirely kind of realistic or, or necessarily you know really the, the you know the, the point of what we might be able to do with digital or online environments you know which, which might be things that are more specific. So most of the things that I've seen online are versions of what would be offline, sort of in an online world. I've seen I've seen very few things that are kind of genuinely produced that you know in, in order to be kind of operating um, online. Um, or, or that make you know full full use of the of the resources that that might that might provide in terms of you know the mass audiences that they can reach and different temporalities and all of that. Um, so in terms of in terms of the question of of, of, of pausing, I, I suppose I'm, I, personally it, it's less about the idea of slowing everything down and and, and kind of starting again because I'm not sure how realistic you know that is. I mean I, you know I, I deep, deeply believe this can have a huge impact on the way we work. But I wonder whether, you know, there's something, I suppose I'm a little bit kind of nervous about thinking that one can kind of too quickly assimilate everything that's happened. You know, it's only, I mean, we, we feel like we've been in this kind of state for forever, but it's only been four months. And, and actually, I know just, you know, as an artist, if you move cities or you go to a new place, it, it, it does take quite a long time to actually begin to be able to do anything that's of, of, of a sort of, you know, that, that's kind of reflective enough or of reasonable enough quality. Um, or you know in, in engagement. So 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 in a sense, it, it feels to me like um, we just mustn't be in too much of a hurry to, to imagine that we're going to reinvent everything. I think it's just going to take a lot longer for what's happened to us to sink in because I think we've all been through probably a, you know a, a certain kind of trauma that we're not quite allowing ourselves to recognise because we need to just kind of carry on for the time being. But but I think I think the impact will probably be longer term. Thank you. I've got two more hands. So Guy and then Karine. It, it's both uh, a comment to, to Susie about, uh, I agree, we have to develop the, the media that we need, but even the existing media, we can use them in creative ways. Um, and then combined with this idea of pulse, just to give an example, one of the projects that was uh, interrupted was a, an exchange between Jean Abreu, who is a Brazilian choreographer based in, in UK in London, and he was supposed to have an exchange with uh, uh, Naish Wang, who's a Chinese choreographer based in Toronto. They never met before. They'd been preparing this for a year. They were supposed to do a residence together in Ottawa, the National Arts Center, to meet for the first time in the studio uh, in April. So this was canceled. And then we had, we decided, because I was involved as a kind of mentor dramaturg, we decided to, to find an online alternative and it took a while to find the right format, but we did two things using the existing platform, which is Zoom. First is that we, we said, instead of kind of having immediately live conversations, uh, each, both of them would send each other once a week a digital letter. Because the letter has this advantage that you can make it in your own time, you can think about it, you send it, the other one receives it, he reads it in his own time and he responds to it. So we said, we'll do the letter writing, on a weekly basis, but in a digital way. But there's a certain delay which allows for reflection, for re response. So this was one thing. And then the other thing that we also discovered is that actually we can rehearse simultaneously on Zoom if we just use the audio as a contact. 
if you put on the screen, it would give too much information, it would be disturbing. So what they did, they would set up, they would film themselves at home while only having the audio connection while they were rehearsing. And they would have, afterwards they could look at the video, but the audio created the kind of, because again, Zoom would switch when one of them was audible. So there, there was, a, there was a, and it was beautiful like to, so, even with the existing technology, you can find ways to 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 use it, and it was it, for them it was very purposeful. And for sure, it didn't replace the work they were supposed to do in the studio, and they're still hoping for in the future to call, to be able to meet. But again, there was this huge sense that, and instead of doing two weeks, we did about two months of once of these online exchanges. But now, the, the, again, the depth of their preparation is, is, has advanced much more. And there is something, again, in my own experience, uh, all my, re my actual work is being canceled or re replaced by these, these online things. But I also feel it's, it, it is a sabbatical that I ha haven't been able to give myself for a long while. And I'm reflecting on, on my own professional future. I'm, uh, having time to finish a book that I wanted to finish for many years and never had time to. And the book seems to be also relevant to what we're going through. So, um, uh, and then to reconnect, it does mean that arts funding should have another basis. Again, I'm luckily, uh, in, I think the reality here in a lot of, in Austria or in a lot of continental Euro, um, countries is different. So here we, we the government, took a while, but now all, most freelance artists, there is some substantial support to get us through this thing. And maybe again, the funding should not be so much uh, product oriented, but should be more about also community oriented or, or individuals that they just have a, a basic income to, 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 to do their, the work that they need to do like that. Thank you, Guy. And now, of course, I'm longing to join in with this conversation, but I'm going to be a good chair and bring Kareen in. Um, yeah, the, the, this whole idea of pausing in some respects is it's a luxury afforded to the people that generate work. And, I, and one of the things that con concerns me, I think there's a bit, it's very variable, um, the extent to which artists actually are supported by funding. My, the, the extent to which I am, for example, supported by funding is mostly through the network of venues and other projects around the country, all of whom, most of whom depend on subsidy, but I don't receive any direct subsidy myself and I, I never have done. Um, and what I'm finding is that whilst I might, I might, I might quite re relish the idea of pausing and minimising what I need and what I earn, um, I can probably earn enough to keep myself, but in reality, in a normal year, I pay the wages of up to 10 other people um, who are band members, engineers, filmmakers, managers, agents. There are a lot of people that make most of my turnover. 80% um, of it pays other people's wages, and I can't pay any of those people's wages right now. So that whole freelance economy on which my artistic practice depends um, is much, much more vulnerable than I am, actually. And I can be quite nimble about the decisions I make about what I do. And, um, and I can, but I can't absolutely, and there are no circumstances in which I can generate income um, for 10 people. Um, and that really worries me. So, so the idea of pause is, some people can pause. If, you can pause if you have resources, again, but you can't pause if you are not the driver of the engine. <laughs> um, you're totally dependent upon other people generating that um, industry for you. So I'm worried about that. Um, the other thing I'm worried about, which is quite specific to my sector, I think of music, which is the, the bulk of where I um, make my work in this um, rush to on, online, um, is it's really brought up the inequality of, of what uh, is available to musicians in the online realm. And it's made many of us realize how inequitable, for example, the streaming system is for music, because music is very easily digitized, how unjust the distribution of income is from streaming. And th th this whole idea that, that Juan mentioned of, of like trying to replicate your existing practice online doesn't work because in reality now what happens for musicians who I think have dominated that rush to you know, online presence is that people are dependent upon tip jars and coffee subs 
and and I absolutely, as a union member, my heart bleeds for the idea that we're essentially begging people for their their income. That's what I did like 25 years ago when I was working in cafes and stuff like that. So I think this what the digital platforms are for. It's also about what worth the things that are presented on online or digital platforms. What worth do they have to the people who receive them is the other question, not just the technology behind how they work. And Corinne, you've echoed a point made too by an audience member, Finley McDermott, who says exactly that. I'd be interested to hear panelists' thoughts on the hyperabundance of freely available online content, how to preserve or reimagine value, careful attention and fair exchange. And it sort of felt to me as if at the very beginning there was a big rush where everybody wanted to say, we're still here. Uh, and, and as you say, Guy, people are being very imaginative in terms of how they're utilizing online platforms in, in creative ways. But, but behind that, unless you can actually build a system where people can monetize that content and replace lost box office income, it becomes problematic. Um, I don't know whether anybody else has anything else to observe on that point. Susie. I mean, there's a... I'm gonna hate myself for saying it out loud. There's an inevitable period of collapse, isn't there? There, there? This is a broken system. So what we're talking about now, this latest bit of conversation is about how we can retrieve elements of the system in order to support the people who have operated well in that system. But we're in a system decline at the moment. And there are chasms now opening up that are visible for the first time. Part, I mean, you know, when I look at it through a childcare lens, it's, it's horrifying. Um, it would take us in a whole different world, so we'll not do it. But um, and for, for some of the new ways of creating value, can we call it worth or, or connection, connection even, we have to see some systems decline elsewhere in order to reorient what we're doing in order to create the, the world that Kareen described at the beginning, which is hyper-local and is about supporting community and self within community. But we can't do that whilst trying to repair all the old, all the old systems at the same time and trying to uh, Remonetize the dregs of what's left. It's not that those two things don't function together. I don't think. I can't see how to make them function together. I can see how to dream up better ways of doing things, and that's the bit that excites me somewhere in the future. And a bit of work I've been doing is around a journey of hope and around imagination and storytelling and how you tell better futures and how the cut like the twelve year olds you guys have, how they thrive into a future that currently looks pretty damn awful if we can do that and instead of focusing on how to sell tickets you know think rethinking where that what that value system looks like but i don't have but that doesn't give us an answer for i'm really aware it doesn't give us an answer for the short term and in that short to medium term there is a period of loss yeah, and in parallel with that point, there's a comment coming through from Lucy Mason, who agrees with Hannah's observation that there's a growing sense that artists and venues are coming into opposition. And this is making, this is causing great discomfort, I think, for, for, for many people at the moment. And Lucy's wondering whether any of the panel members might suggest how we can achieve a way of working that brings artists and venues and indeed other aspects of our infrastructure together so that we can avoid that perceived divide and achieve some honest collaboration, um, which brings us back to that perspective that actually everybody wants to find a way of working through this. The, the doing that, the how is, is, is complex and, and, and not straightforward. Any thoughts? No hands up yet. Well, Hannah, thank you. I don't know if I have an answer, but I can talk about the experience of feeling like a bottom feeder all the time. And um, it's exhausting. Um, sometimes I fantasize with friends about a reverse world where um, organizations and institutions were all freelancing. And for a, for a week, let's say a week in the year, <laughs> artists and makers were given a salary, right? And then uh, we basically would then employ the producers and the curators. Um, that, that's not going to happen. But universal basic income might be a good place to start. Um, then maybe we'd all have the privilege to pause. 
without an an being an anxious all the time. Thank you. Juan, I was going to bring you in. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I liked Hannah, your, um, uh, your disdain for the term platform before, because I've, 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 I've thought the same. And I think a lot of, you know, it's, it's a sort of, it's, it's an interesting metaphor that's been uh, used to really avoid people having to talk about websites all the time, because generally if you talk about, it's just a website. Um, and it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's a kind of comforting uh, metaphor, I suppose. So it's quite physical and it's quite easy to imagine. I always think of kind of four scaffolding legs and the kind of you know, bits of wood on the top when people stand on the platform. You're all higher. Well, not quite. <laughs> but, it, but, in, but in a sense, th this idea of the kind of, um, or this notion that maybe, maybe some of us have, have felt about the kind of, uh, well, sort of inadequacy of some of the digital platforms, you know, and, and, and this proliferation of events online and, and you know, exhibitions and this, this rush to do things that, that I think we, many of us have said, you know, can, can be great, but, that, that, you know, you, you start wondering why you'd want to kind of see so many or do so much. So I'm trying to get to the point. It does, it does for me sort of make me think about the importance of some of our kind of physical platforms or our venues as they're, as they're, as they're called there and how, you know, how significant those, those kind of contexts um, are. And, and I mean, personally, I'd sort of, you know, I'd hate to think that there was, there was, a, there was an excessive kind of um, opposition or, or, or rift between kind of artists and the people who run kind of venues, platforms, the theatres, galleries. Because in, in, in my experience of kind of talking to people across across the sector in the, in the last kind of you know months has been that um, you know to some extent people are in the same in, in, in the same boat and it's you know it's a very kind of precarious kind of infrastructure and and, and, and in which a lot of people are really are really are really suffering at the moment and so I, I haven't got an answer for that but I think it is it is really important um, that 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 kind of um, you know. It, I suppose I'm trying to say that it seems to me that while, while you know, for, it, it, it's kind of possible to some extent, I suppose, for artists to operate kind of independently, and one might think that, that an online environment facilitates that. I think the last one once have proven that it's quite difficult um, to establish, uh, you know, the, these sorts of these sorts of um, um, interfaces or, or, or platforms that are really as effective as we might really want them to be, because. Um, and I guess it, it maybe it, it's maybe to do with, with with maybe the art of kind of programming and, and and to some extent also you know one thing that that seems maybe a little bit absent so far from um, uh, art that that, that it, uh, online online programming is is a kind of critical vocabulary or a critical framework that kind of addresses things in in, in 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 the way that art you know is critically addressed in if you like in the real world. Um, so I, d I don't know the answer, but I think I think trying to find a way of, of, of these things not feeling too separate is does seem important to me. Thank you. And I suppose I'm going back to your question of why were we not prepared and thinking about that in the frame of some of the language that's being used at the moment, like build. How do we build back better? What do you think that needs to happen now, apart from pausing, reflecting, and thinking about how we got to this place and, and, and how we can build a practice that can exist within the space that we're in. Are there other things systemically that we need to do to find a way of building a future that enables the arts to flourish? What, that's a big question and we've only got 15 minutes to answer it, Kareem. Well, one of the things that I'd like to see the world of arts and culture doing is thinking beyond itself. Because a lot of the issues around this are really, they're, they're broad societal issues about, about fairness and about um, work and about income and about well-being. And, and, and I'm interested in movements like the well-being economy. And um, I think there's a lot of bigger ideas out with the world of arts and culture around economy and culture and um, and you know, and just community that are actually not our ideas; <laughs> they're much bigger. And I'd like to see us allying ourselves as working people um, who contribute to our communities and economies with people in other in other sectors. Because right now, to be frank, nobody really cares about like in in terms of general like public. Nobody gives a monkeys if a bunch of like songwriters and filmmakers and dancers don't have work. But I, I, I genuinely think that's true. It's like for most people, it's like, whatever, you know? And actually in fairness, the story about why that should matter is not being told well. It's a story for, for all of us to tell through our art and through the way that we talk to people that do other kinds of work, um, is that the issues that are affecting us and 
the splits between institutions and individuals, salaried people and freelancers. This is our entire economy and society. So more of that, more of looking beyond our own little internecine battles and um, worries, I think would serve us well. I'm seeing lots of nods. So Stuart, on to you and then on to Susie. Okay, so, so working um, with the networks and being a production company, how it works is your production company, you go out, people come to you or you go out there to discover new stories. And then through that production company, you then, you, you then pitch to um, the, net, the networks. And what's happened is um, post Black Lives Matter, what's happened now is you've got these networks that are spending 100 million over three, th over three years for, to, for BAME representation. You've got, you, they're all doing it. And there's many, many people contacting me saying, oh, we became aware, we have, you know, we, sh we shouldn't, we should have known more. And what, and what, what I've um, asked was, well, why did, why now, you know, why did we not, why did you not, it's funny because um, uh, my narrative last year and the year before that was, look, we need better representation. Um, I don't, no one was really listening. Now they're listening because the light has been sh is shone on them. What they were doing in these production companies were they were hiring people that they knew, so there was a fast turnaround because the budgets that were, were given to make television shows or online content um, were very low. So they were it was a it was a little community. That's why you you will notice that that you see a lot of the same things on on uh, BBC and Janapur and etc. But you've got these online companies companies like uh, Netflix that are working with production companies all over the world, all over the place. Um, so what, what the point I'm trying to make is, is that the change that we're starting to see now within the BAME community is now they're going, wait, hold on a minute, these people are here, they're over there, we should be listening to them now. That has, that has been the problem. It's been these people in these boardrooms that are talking amongst themselves they need to get content out there as soon as possible they've got mortgages to pay they don't want to take any risks and that that's what the issue is people are now pe people prior to this should have been taking risks now you've got these companies that are going right we've got like like what you've got 100 million for in the next three years where did you get that from that's not it's a lot of money you know it's like why were people not listening so what's happened now is is the younger generation are not looking at, they're not looking at the, the, the networks and going, I could tell my story th through the networks. What I will do is I will go on YouTube, I will learn during that time, I will learn and I'll use the, the platforms like YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, to tell my story. Now, the, one of the people that I've been working with that w was in the documentary has excelled through, um, has excelled through this um, lockdown and used um, YouTube as a, as a platform and is doing really well. So now what has happened is the production companies are now turning back around and looking at these these people um, uh, online and going, right, okay, we see you now, let me start to, to tell your, your story. So in sense of what Karina's saying is like, um, they don't they don't really care about um, artists, they don't care about, that is very, very true, they, they, they don't care, but um, I think what these networks are learning now is they need to start to to listen to people like ourselves. We hope we we hold the power. They don't hold the power. They 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 hold the platform, but it's us that hold the power. I am able to go and speak to a sea of of um, black people and tell their story. Unfortunately, they can't go ahead and do that. So I think what people one of the main things people need to take away is that we are the power. We are the powerful ones, not them. We are the storytellers, not them. What they are is commissioners who who will listen to your story, go and speak to their boss and go, is it okay if I give this person, if this group of people money so that they can go and make this? Now, what, what I'm doing is I'm speaking to these networks. I've shunned away um, um, a couple of networks who say, no, I'm not going to work with you. Now what I say is like, I've created this piece of content. Um, I feel it's good for your platform. However, if you're not interested in, 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 it, in it, just know that there's this platform, that platform as well. Sorry for using the word platform, but um, just basically saying, look, I'll be making this anyway. I'll be making it anyway. So I don't need you. You need you need me. And and that that is what I've learned that the little guy can do. Once they feel empowered, 
than the larger the, the larger oyster because these these um these networks are like um ducks underwater. They may seem that they're fine, but 60, 60 um, staff members have gone from the BBC Scotland um, over the last month or so. So that's it's for the little people, you know. Thank you, Stuart. I'm going to move swiftly on Susie and then one. Um, so I just I wanted to pick up on some of what Karine was saying um, about moving beyond our little world. And I 100% agree with you. I mean, God, the number of times I've heard in this journey, in this lockdown period, what people need is, I'm like, really? <laughs> they do? How do you know? I don't need that. And I'm on your side. So, <laughs> um, so, but there's something about really understanding that what we do and what we can do as groupings of creative people is way more than produce bits of art. Somehow we've become fixated, we could do the art histor history bit another time, but somehow we've got fixated on the moment of the production, but actually it's the work and the way of working and the methodologies and the challenge that we bring to things and the way we bring people together and the way that we, uh, grow and foster and drive imagination that's the bit that's the bit that you cannot get anywhere else and if we can bring that into other worlds and other worlds into that then we're we're vital again right but at the moment we're so sidelined in our own space having these discussions about venue versus it freelancer and it's important in order to survive in the short to medium term it is not important to anyone outside our world or indeed, I would say, to the future of what humanity is. So, yeah. I'll stop. Thank you. And one. Oh, my to seem very trivial now, Susie. <laughs> um, no, I, I was just, um, to, to, to Stuart's point about, about kind of narratives and, um, you know, the stories and what, what, what we hold and what value we hold, I think, that, I think that's so true. I think you made that point really, really well. I mean, and I think it's kind of, it's curious just reflecting on my own experience of spending kind of my days thinking about you know online delivery online pla platforms how to do this and this and that and then and then actually coming to the end of the day and finding that i'm kind of much more conscious of where i'm i've got kind of you know things in the house that i want to look at or don't want to look at or you know spending much longer in conversations with people with individuals i've even kind of picked up my guitar recently you know just things really really practical things that are which are kind of about, I mean, I think they're about well-being and about, you know, all, all these kinds of things. And I think that's really important that there's narratives and that kind of content or that kind of texture of, um, you know, um, artists and creators' lives is, is given a bit more, more credence, a bit more significance. I have to say, though, I, I do think this, the, the, another thing that I think is really important, and I'm, I'm kind of really fascinated in this conversation today, is just, is just to hear a bit more about how other people's kind of... Um, Sort of industries work. I mean, in, in this kind of cross art form platform, I, I never really thought about how a musician kind of uh, you know gigs or how a film you know film. I mean, I have thought about it, but it, but it, it, it's quite interesting to, to just think about the, the different kind of industrial models of the arts, uh, which aren't the be all and end all. But it just makes me think. Well, you know, I wonder if there are other 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 ways of kind of doing things that we that, that you know might 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 arise out of what we're of what we're of what we're learning. I mean, Guy, maybe some of the things that you said are have that sort of hybridity or Hannah and, and, and others as well but 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 it's only that's been really interesting for me in this in this conversation it makes me think maybe um about you know other, other kind of practical models of of, of dissemination and, and reward and uh, and engagement that, that that might be possible thank you and we've got a, a point um from Lucas um Chi Peng Gao, uh, who's on that line as well in terms of, of his comment um, so agrees that everyone's in a different boat in the pandemic and what sort of innovations or interesting exciting developments in the arts have you seen or experienced during the lockdown um, or can see emerging afterwards so are there opportunities uh, I suppose going back to the very beginning of our conversation are there opportunities for things to change uh, are there things that we can take hold of and wrestle with and reopen a new imagination to thinking about during during this period in time um, we have got um, just over five minutes left does, does anybody want to bring any examples into play Corrine you've got your hand up oh well maybe I might not be the most innovative person to ask um, but um, do you know it's not it's not innovative it's just smart thinking about situations so, so an innovation needn't be super super sassy and high tech and and all the rest of it i had a lovely exchange with a theater company that i wrote for earlier in lockdown a little narrative piece and um, that they put out in a if i was honest in an unsatisfactory fashion so i probably shouldn't say that against my commissioners but i basically filmed myself running around my garden in my local park it was rubbish i was very grumpy that day and it's a terrible 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 video but i quite like the, the piece that i wrote and what they've done 
And so they, they've thought about the, um, the fact that um, many of the people who might otherwise be interested in that piece can't access it because they don't, they don't go on YouTube and Vimeo and look at videos, and certainly not really poorly shot videos. And, um, and they've been offering a phone service to older people in the area, and they've been hiring actors and narrators to read the script in conversation with older people. It's really super intimate kind of in engagement. Um, and it's been about reading the piece and then having a conversation. It's all very safe. It's, you know, lots of, there's lots of things thought about how to make that a, a safe space and a respectful space. And I was deeply moved to find out that this thing that I had written had flown away onto someone else's tongue and was being um, offered in care home settings and one-to-one -one conversations with isolated older people. Now that's not really high tech stuff at all, but it's smart sideways thinking about how to make meaningful work. And to me, that's the whole thing. This issue of what is the, who's this for? Who, who really needs it? And actually if there is need, need manifests itself. And I think maybe that's what Stuart has spoken to with the whole issue of recognizing actually at a, mo at a moment, this pivot moment in time, especially around all the Black Lives Matter stuff, people need your work. They need your work and the work of your peers. And I thank goodness if there's recognition of that, finally, like need will up, it'll, it'll, it'll bubble up and we should be ready for it. Absolutely. And, and that, again, the chimes with a point from the, um, the audience from Sandy Watson, who's, who's uh, talking about the interest in the relationship between artists and audiences uh, and a wee bit of a criticism for the panel, uh, saying that the panel are asking as many questions as providing answers. Uh, so Sandy is asking whether panel members have ideas to share about how the relationship between artists and audiences can be addressed uh, and thinking about the need to make a decent living um, in relation to your work. Um, who wants to answer that? I mean, we could start thinking about audiences for a start, and we could start thinking about ourselves as people working with people, that might help. I mean, I, you know, the segregation, this, oh God, I hear this so often. We do this and they do that. Really? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it means that you set up a transactional space immediately and the transaction has to be completed in order for there to be profit, in order for people to survive. Actually, if we're making, because we're, go back to that vitality thing, because there is a need for imagination, there is a need for the methodologies we use in order to create better futures, in order to thrive, then we're embedded in society. We're part of a, a world that has citizens in it rather than artists and consumers. Yeah, and we've got a, a point here, actually an interesting point, just for our last few minutes, noting on the difference in language between the men on the panel and the women on the panel. Is that something that you have picked up yourselves? Um, so uh, feeling that, that, that male language is management speak and female language is, is more around leadership. Uh, I, I can't say I've noticed that directly myself today. However, Stuart. Uh, just a quick one for 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 me. It's for, as I always say. As I as I was saying, it's all about um, representation um, and inclusion. So for me, it's not more so management. For me, it is about leadership. For me, it's about um, to try hopefully trying to be that leader and bringing other people on board. But as I say, it's not even bringing other people on board. It's bringing other leaders who are not yet, let's say, recognised because because we're all the same. So. For me, as I said, it's about empowerment. Um, definitely not not going down um, the management route because no one should really manage us because we we all have we all, we all think differently, you know. So, just to put that out there, that it's not about management, um, and Sandy. So, we'll be fine. <laughs> yes. So we have talked about many things over the course. Oh, Kareen, I'll bring you in. <laughs> Just wanted to go back to a point at the, the issue of, of, of criticising us for um, asking more questions than answers. Because um, I don't think it's the purpose of art to offer answers to things. I think it's the purpose to open things up for discussion and, and you know, and new experiences and new understandings. So to me, it's all about questions. That's the whole point for me of making anything. And the other thing that Susie said about remembering that we are people making for people and that the work that will survive will be the, the work that is meaningful to people and feels like an honest engagement with other people, however it's made, whether it's made on a mass digital platform or in tiny little spaces. And I think that's a threat to some people within the arts and culture um, scene because some people just frankly don't make meaningful work 
for enough people. And uh, do you know what? And if, if those things don't survive, there's no great loss in that. Thank you, Hannah. Um, just to add to that, who was it that said people make theatre, not bricks and mortar? Just to add that. Brilliant. So we, we are now almost at half past, so that we're going to conclude this evening's discussions. I, 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 there's been so much that's been so interesting in this conversation. I can't thank you enough for coming together. Uh, we've recorded this, so you will be able, we will be able to all watch it slowly and process it afterwards. Um, the words that have leapt out to me are meaning and community and connections and behaviours and representation and most importantly futures and how can we find a way of resetting how we do things in the traumatizing time that we found ourselves in so that we can we can feed those green shoots and find ways of enabling arts practice to continue. You've been an absolutely brilliant panel. Um, so thank you to all of you for being here this evening. And thank you too to our BSL interpreters, um, Donna and Greg. Um, just been fantastic to, to see you again. Uh, we'll be meeting again uh, for another conversation next Monday at six, but for now, I'll say goodbye to all of you. I feel like we should have some nice music now, which we haven't got. <laughs> got organized um however we can imagine it in our heads thank you very much um and uh, good night and have a good rest of the evening <laughs> bye bye <laughs>